just started this because, with a photo of myself, which actually was taken at, Marina, were you at that party? The, it was the, um, the, you're shaking your head. Okay, this was Farrah Fawcett Miner's goodbye party, and I actually have the invitation in the uh, presentation as well. But I really had a lot of fun in punk because I used to paint my face like a Matisse painting. I did get my MFA in design from CalArts, but I also have my BA from Cal State Northridge, and I have tons and tons of art history books, and I photograph like a painter. I don't really care for much photography, um, so and I came to this because I love Broadway musicals and movies, so that was my history. I had no idea what a rock and roll photo was even supposed to look like. I didn't know anything about the magazines. I didn't know anything about the record companies. I didn't know anything other than I knew a lot of art, and Iggy, Iggy said that too. Okay, so um, what would be your left is Mary Rat, and then there's Helen Keller on the right. Um, oh, this is a quote from The Mask. To escape horror, bury yourself in it. I think we pretty much look at Michelle going, ah, ha, 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 boy, Michelle, you've got stories. We all, all of us who survived those early LA times, we have stories we can't even make public. <laughs> okay, so... Um, before I talk about the Ramones, I was, November 75, I was out in Granada Hills. I was renting a little home. I had earned my master MFA a year before in October 74. And I looked at this new magazine called People, which used to be really interesting then. And it, oh my God, Mark made it. Hi, you're in this, okay. That's my best friend from punk. Okay, boy, does he have stories. Okay, so um, I saw this picture of this androgynous looking woman and she had a book in one hand and the other hand was just expressive and she was quoting Rimbaud and I know symbolist poets because of symbolist painters and I thought, wow, that's really cool, I'll have to check her out. So I bought horses and I was standing on a step stool in my home hallway rearranging books on the bookshelf, which I do all the time because I read incessantly and I heard the beginning of horses. And I got jumped off the stool and I picked up the needle and I kept playing it because as a nice Jewish girl, I could really, really, really relate to Jesus didn't die. Oh, you know the thing. I'm not even going to cry and quote it. You look it up. I'm terrible about quotes and I've had one hour sleep, so I'm not going to mess it up. But anyway, so in January, I stood in line to see her at the Roxy and I was in the second show. And... Okay, there's the Roxy, and then extending that were bushes. So I was standing right at the end of where the building was. I see all these people just get out of their car, and they just walk right in. And I'm standing there, and I have my Scarlett O'Hara moment of, as God is my witness, my family and I will not go hungry. Well, I'm like, as God is my witness, I'm going to be part of this. <laughs> part of this. I hadn't even seen Patty yet, but I was going to be part of it. And I had this little mental checklist. Okay. I cannot carry a tune. I admire everybody who can. Um, I can't write lyrics. I can't play an instrument. I can't manage. But I'm going to figure out a way to be a part of this. That was my whole list. That was my world. That's all I knew. And I started going to a lot of shows and reading and subscribing to Punk Magazine, New York Rocker, and Backdoor Man. And um, got the Ramones album the first day it was out. And I went to the first show, the first night, both shows, and the second night, I grabbed my camera. And this photo of Dee Dee was taken during that tour. I'm not really sure what hotel. I did not know he has this thing about taking a lot of baths and showers. I read that after he died. So anyway, I had um, a nice Jewish girl from the valley. My photo was in spins a bit for Dee Dee, which is kind of a, a weird um, thing to as an honor, but I, Dee Dee was just so very sweet. And I, it meant a lot to me because I was so alone in my life. I, I remember telling my neighbor, these guys let me stay, hang out with them. They let me take pictures, they talk to me, and they're really cool. So um, when we went up to San Francisco, I photographed Joey by the pool, and this was in Herb Magazine. Uh, it was a cover blurb, and then there was a whole several pages, and I asked Danny Fields the name of the hotel, and he said it was a CD dive hotel off Van Ness. And then when Joey died, Spin used my photo, and this cool story that I used to drive, this was in February 77, but in August 76, I drove the Ramones around a lot. And uh, so when they returned, 
Tamara or Arturo asked me to drive them to Little Tokyo, which I've never been to, even though I'm born and raised here. And we're walking down the street and I see this guy and he's doing the Joey thing. So I said, Joey, would, would you stand over there and do this? Now, I didn't usually pose people because I was really shy about it. And I really wanted to be real photojournalist, just photograph things as they happen, but I couldn't let this pass up. And I love this. And surprisingly, this is the photo that people like the most. They like Joey and his long legs by the pool. And actually, it's edited a bit because you could see both of his feet. But this was it. This was Joey. And then Johnny, when we were up in San Francisco at Aquarius Records, I photographed him smiling. And this opened the last interview because they knew that he was dying of prostate cancer. And when they had the um, statue dedication at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, somebody called my name and the woman next to me looked up to me and she said, you're Jenny Lenz. You took that photo of Johnny smiling in spin. And it was Johnny's widow, Linda. And she said, I don't have any photos of Johnny smiling. And I said, I have lots. <laughs> and it wasn't to be one up her, it was I'm real spontaneous. The people who know me know, I, you know I'm no filter here. So I'm very pleased to say that she now controls my photos. Um, she has the Joey and Johnny and Dee Dee has, Estate has my Dee Dee's. And there's a new Fender bass guitar, that's a Dee Dee, Ramon Fender bass guitar. And they just had a, a show in New York at the Chelsea and they had a whole wall of my photos. And then they have this little scrapbook when you buy the, the bass guitar um, that has a bunch of my pictures. So I'm really pleased about that because I tried for years to get my pictures out there and I just said finally, you know what, take them. So um, on November 6th, I went with the backdoor men to the Roosevelt Hotel and photographed Ron Ashton I didn't know who the Stooges were. They weren't on the radio. I had no idea. Actually, I met him at a party. Fast Freddie, the editor publisher of Backdoor Man, brought him to a party that I had out in the valley. And I had pictures of Ron and I making out in the kitchen. So, oh, it, and, and this one was also on the masthead of Cream Magazine, and it's been collected. So now, November, and Patty's back in town. I am so ready for her. Except that I developed all 42 rolls of film wrong because I read it in a magazine. So the negatives are really thin and I had to use high contrast paper. And um, so this glow is not in the computer, it's on the, the uh, negative. And I just had some fun in the computer because I like doing that because I get really bored. Just all I do all day is resize these pictures over and over again. So I was just playing. Then on the next shot, she's lying over and Patty has used all of these without ever crediting me correctly. And uh, I believe that this is what she was also wearing on the cover of Rolling Stone in that famous photo where it was um, on fire in the back. And this is just one image twice where I just played with the color because I like doing that. Okay, so the night before Blondie played, I saw them sitting at a booth at the Whiskey and I was photographing Rick Derringer. And, um, I took the shot and I printed it and then they signed it and yay. Okay, Blondie was amazing. They were so much fun. And this picture has Rodney and Peter Leeds. Ooh, Peter Leeds is on the back next to Rodney. Yeah, we'll I'll play into it later. Okay, fact is, here's his story. Okay, so backdoor man. Dee Dee Faye was one of the writers and she was d another writer, Don Waller's girlfriend. And she told me she wanted Blondie pictures and I went to the Capitol swap meet um, with my proof sheets and she pointed to this and she said, that's our cover. And I said, mm -mm -mm -mm. you can see your underwear. I'm a nice Jewish girl. No, 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 no. Jenny, it's the cover, make a print. So I'm out in the valley cleaning my parents' home, which I did once a week because it helped pay the bills, 20 bucks a week or something. And I called Blondie's office and I said, I wanna come by and show you this photo. And the person on the phone said, it's fine, leave us alone, go away. So later, I this would be in October when we'll talk about this. Um, how many of you were at the punk fashion show? Oh, well, Marina, you were on stage, hello. And wh who's next to you? Hi, nice to see you. Okay, uh, Mark, were you at the punk fashion show? Yeah, okay, all right, yes. So I'm standing on a, stair, a chair, which I used to do in those days, photographing Blondie, and Peter Leeds, the guy over here, fuck you. Okay, 
He grabs my arm, it's black and blue for days, drags me outside and says I can never photograph them again because I didn't have permission. I'm like, I called. I can get my parents' phone bill because in those days, valley to the city, whatever. <sighs> didn't happen. You can read about it, Rolling Stone online. Blondie later sued him. Not for that, but you know, they finally wised up that he was no good. Ex-offender, I love this. That picture, ex offender. This prints so beautifully, oh, you cannot see it digitally. When I print this blondie and she was wearing her wedding gown and veil that she got in LA Punk store, you can see the netting around the top and you can see the um, embroidery and beads much better on the veil and also on her sleeve. It's just glowing and beautiful. So Mark Martinez told me this. We were over at his house in Eagle Rock in when was like a virgin and Madonna is on MTV Awards crawling on the floor in a wedding gown and Mark says she stole that from Debbie Harry <laughs> I've also read that she wore this in New York do you know how many times people have said that photo of her on the floor with some CBGB's Mojo said that last June Okay, whatever. Okay, oh, this is so cute. Um, so they signed and she put like little cartoon things on it. Okay, oh, this was neat. Okay, so Blondie came back to town in April 14th because television was playing the whiskey. And in February, she told me, she was really supportive and encouraging and she said, because my picture is starting to get published and she said, really go for it. Well, when she came back from February to April, I had pictures, even a column in New York Rocker and other places. And right here, in the backstage of the whiskey, Debbie Harry told me she was really proud of me for getting my pictures published. So I love this photo, and she looks just so sweet here. They were so sweet. And backstage, they were visiting television. And I always call this night CBGB's in LA. And there's television. Well, television has a certain Energy, I love them. I mean, Marky Moon, hello, please, just amazing. But the opening bill, Marina knows all about this. The opening bill was kind of energetic, you know? A band that Jake Riviera was managing called The Damned. So what did they do? Television kicked them off the bill because people were jumping around to The Damned. They didn't like that. So um, we'll get back to The Damned. So that was April 14th, and this week, or these few days are amazing. The next night, Iggy played and Blondie opened. And these are pictures from um, that Santa Monica Civic show of Iggy and my Blondie. So that was Friday night. Oh, oh, I had never seen Iggy before. Now I understood why people were crazy over him. Oh my God, Iggy. Um, th this actually is out of order, but I'll have that in here anyway. Um, because Blondie came to Bump Records. Oh, a little typo there, oops. Need a proofreader. Our sleep. Um, so that's Debbie Harry and Jeffrey Lee Pierce, who later started Gun Club, but he started the first Blondie fan club. Okay. Oops, wrong direction. Okay. So Saturday the 16th, I see Marina getting out of the car with the lead singer of The Damned, Dave Vanian. And I have all these pictures. I have Jenny Buddy with Brian James and Spock, a picture with Rat Scabies and another with um, Captain Sensible, and there's quite a history there of um, Stiff Records and Jake Rivera's band and Marina and Jenny from Backstage Pass. So this was taken at Bomp, which opened on April 9th, and um, what can I say? They were great and fun. So that was on Saturday. All right, so the place was really crowded, and I'm just shooting, whatever looks interesting. And I didn't hear this conversation. But at this point, Pleasant had uh, dared Darby to get on the bill with the weirdos who were playing later that night at the Orpheum. And this is um, when they were having that discussion. Well, I didn't know. So I arrived pretty early, but not early enough for their famous, what, three minute, five minute show with peanut butter and whatnot. But the damned also showed up. And so we have Captain Sensible, Dave Vanian, Jake Riviera, and Brian James um, in the audience. And then Captain Sensible got on stage with the weirdos. Yeah, they were a lot of fun, the weirdos, real colorful. Well, then Jake managed to get them on the bill at the Starwood for Sunday, April 17th, and Monday, April 18th. So this is Sunday. And I love this photo because 
Rodney never gets his due. I, I saw the documentary, I called him up and go, what happened? You were so big and, um, and important in punk, it's not even in the documentary, what happened? So I love this picture because you can just see the camaraderie that you know the damn knew that Rodney was major, he's a star maker, and he would introduce every band and be at the parties. So Captain Sensible's got his arm around him and he's smiling and Rodney's laughing, and that's what it was like then, okay? So that was a great show. Mark, were you at that the damn show? Uh -huh, I figured as much. Marina was. Michelle? Okay, goody, all right. Um, okay, so what happened was um, the Herald Examiner, you know, which you know has the pictures here, the writer was not too impressed by the dam. So Captain Sensible leans over into my ear, he goes, Jenny, pay attention. I'm gonna give him something to write about tonight. <laughs> So I'm on my chair, because I'm not very tall. I'm on my chair, and I'm kind of in front of Brian James, and I'm looking for the camera, and I see Captain Sensible's taking off his clothes. And I jump off the chair, and I drag it over, and it wasn't very crowded. It was easy to move around, okay? So I jump on the chair, and I take a couple quick shots, and I give this print to Jake Riviera, because I'm this nice Jewish girl who has to please everybody who's too stupid. I did, ignorant, let's put it that I did not know you do not give away your prints to be turned into a button that rough trade sells. So the damned and Jake made some money off of it. I didn't. But my favorite part was this was a full page image in Slash Magazine. And I was at the plunger pit with Trudy and Helen and Mary Rapp. And there was a party. And I go into the bathroom. And this picture is ha hanging up over the toilet. Because we all did that. We always had pictures on all our walls and stuff. It was perfect. Okay. Oh, my favorite L.A. band. One of my favorite bands of all time. We see Marina going like this. If you saw the Screamers, if you knew Tamata. <sighs> okay. So Bomp Records actually opened on April 9th. I have it a little out of order because I wanted to tell this story of going from um, the 14th to the 18th. What I... Miss though, was on the 17th, after the first night of the damned, Captain Sensible and Rodney went to Cantor's and there was a food fight and I was there taking pictures. On Monday, oh, there was a party. I have pictures of Marina dancing in the kitchen. I have pictures of the damned dancing. We were having so much fun. Yeah, so the screamers, ugh, could talk 14 hours on them. Um, Tamada came from New York. He knew a lot of people. He had they had a Blondie Ramones party in February, and um, so I was photographing them around town, and they showed up at the opening at Bomp, and we walked outside, and I took some pictures, and this is just up against the wall, and they were so incredible because they just knew how to pose. So we have on your left, we've got Tommy Gear, and in the middle we have Oscar nominated for art direction for her, K.K. Barrett, the drummer, and the late, dearly departed, multi-talented Tamada Duplenty. He is just everywhere. I have photos of him at parties, at the mask, at shows, and they put on the best parties. And the great thing was, with all of this, there were no stylists. We all were doing this ourselves. We had parties. Some people baked food, but it wasn't about the food. It wasn't about the decorations. It was about the people. And I will never go to parties like these again, because it was just people, and we were pretty wild. Okay, at the same time, I love this photo, but it's not as well known, but I love the angle of it. I lean down, and I just love the um, phone wires, and it's out in North Hollywood, and it was so valley in the dusk, the lighting was great, and it just, it just to me, there's something, um, that it's, it's very noir. I, I just relate to it. I look at it and I think of Out of the Past and Big Combo and all these film noir movies. So I just love it. Okay, so I go over to the Screamers and I had rented some lights and I took some pictures of their home and they changed clothes and we went down to Gower Gulch, which had a great magazine stand there. And it was right next to SIR Records, which is where major people were recording, which used to be Columbia studios. It's where Rita Hayworth danced in Cover Girl and oh, 
Gene Kelly. Oh my God, Gene Kelly. Anyway, um, so after he went to the newsstand, okay, Tamada got his favorite magazine, which was soon banned, Violent World. It's a violent world. Get used to it. We went around the corner and we saw this little old lady sitting there and um, I have pictures of Gorilla Rose, who was a friend of theirs, who used to be in the Coquettes. Tamada and, and Gorilla were in that. Um, and Gorilla is asking if I can take pictures. So I'm standing back, and you can see a little shadow on the left. It's my Alfred Hitchcock touch. And I got one photo. I shot a few more, but when it was done, I went over to Tamada, and I said, I don't know if I got anything I could use. You wouldn't stop laughing. And he said, Ah, she was just so cute. Did you see what she was reading? <sighs> a newspaper about a two-headed baby alien <laughs> with cat eye glasses and a neck brace. <laughs> no art direct. She's just sitting there at the bus stop. The other thing I love is palm trees. You cannot say this was shot in New York. I defy you. You know, you can think that my photos are at CBGB's, but this is it says Gower. Okay, there's two things. The Gower signs don't match. The topography is different. The shape is different. Graphic artist Mark would notice it. I notice it. But I love underneath the palm trees is a man in Bermuda shorts. <laughs> if that's not California, what is? Okay. So I apparently, I gave prints to a lot of people because when I reconnected with people in the 90s, <laughs> I'm always talking about the 1900s because that's what I have to date all these things. We're in the 2000s now, 15th year. Okay, about 10 years ago, I started connecting with people, thank goodness, because of email. And so many people um, I'd given this print to, but I remember years ago when I'd show it to people and they all said, you got the sign of the devil. Yeah. Huh? What? What? Devil? I'm Jewish. I don't, we don't believe devil. They go, you know, the beast. Uh, no? What? What? Okay, apocalypse. Apocalypse? What's the apocalypse? Book of Revelations. Oh, is that like the New Testament? So apparently I got the 666 means something. And Exine put it on the cover of some of the songbooks later. But So this has a lot of relevance for people who believe that. Um, but it got a lot of notice because of that 666. And then to the left of that, it says surfer's rule. And I'm, I'm looking at Mark because I have a backstage whiskey photo. And, he, and I think it's the Ramon shot. And he looked at it because it had all this graffiti and it said Chicano's rule. <laughs> so this whole thing that New York started graffiti, I'm a valley girl. There was graffiti in the 50s and 60s. I mean, why is it that New York gets all the credit for things that we did in LA. I love LA. Okay, so that's the Screamers. This was the, the same day with the lights. I tried to get this back. Um, Cream lost the slides. A lot of slides have been lost. Uh, so all I have is this, just this ratty um, tear sheet that I've scanned. But it was real atmospheric. It was real Dr. Uh, cabinet Dr. Caligari and real noir. And I should have, could have, would have done more of that. But I was rather shy and I really like taking pictures of people spontaneously. Okay. The Screamers debut at Samayoff's Loft. And this picture is in the centerfold of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts catalog on punk couture. No, it's from punk, oh, whatever. Um, <laughs> it was last year's, uh, their annual costume gala. And this is really important because I get this from people all the time who were there or now. Bet you had no idea any of this would be, you know, da da da. You'd be talking to the library or it'd be in the Met. It's like, I knew. I, I studied our history. I studied movies. I studied. I studied. And I knew this would be a really short period as well because in the 60s we had a lot of music, but it just changed. It changed really quickly. And so that's why I really dove into it. Um, but I knew damn well that this band was important and what Marina was doing and Michelle and Mark and Jan and everybody who was there, we were creating culture. And I always use the term cultural revolution, but you know, I wasn't blogging it so I don't get credit, but I don't really care. Um, I always looked at this like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. I used to talk about Ballet Russe all the time back in punk. It's, uh, yeah. So anyway, I love this picture. Okay. 
Um, Tommy Gear and the left is at that show, and the right it was just a screamer's party. We've got Tommy and KK and Rand McNally, and Rand helped start Danger House. I was in touch with him a few years ago. He was thinking of doing a book on Black Randy. I don't think he ever will, but oh, wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> okay. I didn't usually photograph outdoors or venues, which I should have, but I was more interested in people and clothes. That's the other thing, why I was doing all this photography. I love clothes. I'm not a fashionista, but old movies and costumes, I just love, and, and old paintings and all that. So anyway, the Mumps are one of those unheralded groups. I absolutely adored them, and everybody who knew Lance, didn't we love Lance Loud? I mean, please, a lot. I used to tell him I wish I were a man so I could be gay for him. <laughs> I loved him. And Christian is so talented. Christian is one who has done some amazing music that people don't know about. But he has quite a career there. And I'm in touch with Rob Dupre, who is standing to the left. Christian has his hands up with the stripes. And the guy on the ground, of course, is Lance. So I did a session with them around the whiskey. It was really fun. And can you imagine the bill, Van Halen, and the mums? You know, we have such segregated music. And I mentioned the 60s. I listened to it all. And that was amazing. We really need that. Our, in our society, we're, we'll define, like, what's punk or not. And listen to a lot of music, seeing a lot of movies, seeing a lot of paintings, seeing a lot of photography. For me, it not only expands my world, but it is who I am. And oh, I have to mention this, the library, I forgot to mention that. I grew up at the library. When I get an email from the LA library, I was so thrilled. I have so many memories of being at the library. I learned so much about art and life and I can just picture myself at the, I love the library. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here. Also, when I got that email about the Metropolitan Museum of Art that they wanted the photo, I wrote back and said, <coughs> I'm so excited, thank you. And they said, well, we're glad to hear that you're excited. And I wrote back and said, anyone who's not excited about getting an email and being involved with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is dead. I mean, come on. But Matt, I mean, I studied art, but I never expected to be. It's kind of like if you've seen Bye Bye Birdie, where they sing Ed Sullivan. It's kind of like that. It's like, Matt. I also have a picture in the Smithsonian. So who knew? But I knew. See, I knew that the people I photographed were important. What I did not know was that my photos were important. And that's something I talk to people about and I feel very strongly these days, that I'm not that much into punk as much as talking to people about manifesting your dreams and as Marianne Williamson says, dream bigger. Yeah, okay, Van Halen. Oh yeah, we were talking about this on the way over. Um, Wendy Horowitz brought me. So we've got the weirdos. <laughs> Yes, this was Slash Magazine's first benefit at Larchmont Hall, and lots of stories there. But I loved the weirdos because they were interesting the way they dressed. And I was just on the side of the stage and had these two wonderful shots of these brothers, and just, you had to be there. They were great. I wasn't really that much into their music, but I love what they wore. In fact, I was more aware of people's visuals than I was their music because I didn't have any money to buy records, and do you think anybody ever gave me anything? So this is Rand McNally, because I'm throwing in some fashion, because I keep talking about how important that is to me. And Rand is wearing his slash button. All oh, my buttons are stolen. And um, Tommy Gear is behind him with torn jeans that you pay a lot of money for now. Who started all that, OK? We did. And Mary Rat, although Mary Rat was at Farrah's goodbye party, which I have some pictures. OK. Oh. Okay, this is outside the whiskey, uh, my April 1977. The woman in the pink is Exine. The woman wearing a toilet roll around her belt is Sherry the Penguin. Do we love Sherry the Penguin? Okay, oh my God. The woman on the ground is, she had to leave Los Angeles. All her toys in black wore out, and her boys had too. She started to hate every N-word, and Jew! This woman gave me a hard time. 
I'll tell you that story. So this is Farrah Fawcett Miners, whose real name is Faye Hart. And yeah, that's what Exene used to wear and just hanging out. I'm going to tell a little story because Mark will love this. One night, Mark and I were standing outside the whiskey, and this car comes by, and they were yelling names at us because we're punks. So I yelled, eat shit and die. <laughs> then we ran into the whiskey, and Mark's like, I can't believe you just did that. I go, I go we're at the whiskey. We're home. They follow us in, they're dead. So yeah, we had fun. Larchmont, this is also, some of these are a little bit out of order because I wanted to show some fashion stuff, but this was um, the second benefit, and we have Top Jimmy, and Pandora, who was the girlfriend of Billy Zoom, who was the guitarist of a little band called X, um, he always said Top Jimmy was the historian. Huh. Oh, yes, I got up early this morning because I realized that some of the people whom I wrote and said they'd be in, I had not included their photos. So unfortunately, I don't have a bigger picture of this, but this is backstage pass. Marina, come on, come on, stand up, wave, do something, okay. <laughs> And this is Holly Vinson, who opened for The Clash in England. And we got together, uh, Mark and Marina and a few others, um, at Jenny's a few years ago. And Marina has some pictures, scrapbooks of this. This was at Mabu Hay and um, backstage with Holly. And Jenny up at, I remember this. Who went to the Griffith Auto Observatory when they had the Lazerium and they were playing UFO? It was some kind of press thing. Yeah, how many people went up? A few of us? Oh, wow, cool. Yeah, so that was this night, day, day, night. Well, it was dark inside. It was our rebel without a cause moment. <laughs> because you know when they're inside looking at the stars and everything and making fun? So yeah, so, and this is Che. Was Che in the band at some point? That's what I thought. Okay, all righty. This was the picture I had to get up and do insert this morning. We got Jenny and Marina, and she still looks just as beautiful. Her hair is the same and everything. So this, on the right, we've got Jenny in this red slicker and Marina looking very um, Theta Barra. And behind her is Billy, and then on the floor is Pandora, and then behind her is Top Jimmy. And then on the left is Sherry the Penguin. I just love this. She's talking to the guard, but in her stockings, she's got a little toy gun. <laughs> This woman was fun to photograph. She had some really outrageous clothes when she wore them. So I had a lot of fun photographing her. <laughs> Natasha. Mark has a nickname for her. Shall I say it? <laughs> Let's see if I can pronounce it as well as you do. Nasnatcha? <laughs> Little Cupid doll. You know, she's Betty Boop and just the sweetest person in the world. And I go into the ladies' room, and she's Lana Turner. I mean, she's. this is what we wore, these thrift store clothes from the 40s, the sense of style. And you can see in the mirror, she has a little white gift bow on it. I, was, I love this photo so much, because you know, I would have loved to have been photographing in Hollywood in the 20s and 30s. And when they had not only faces, but they had style. You see what people wear today? Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, I love this one. Because this is the changing of the guard. On the very left, you can see Helen with her Sioux cat hair. It's white on the, blonde on the top and dark on the side. And then you see Mary Rat and Trudy with her little sailor girl outfit and her chains. And then you see... These girls were all from the South Bay, like um, Palos Verdes, Renato Beach. So now you see the typical South Bay girl with the Farrah Fawcett hair, only a little bit smoother, but the aviator glasses and the pink fuzzy sweater. I just love that. I love that juxtaposition. And I was standing so close, and my camera, I hated my camera. I hate photography, actually, because I had so many technical problems, and things came out at times washed out. So it's a little bright, but it was like, take that picture because you have one second. Okay. So I just added you this morning. And this was the same event. My camera that night was, just, let's just wash everybody out. Now, Mark gave me a really great quote. He's, what he said was, I'm paraphrasing, but in um, Glam, or what I always thought it was called glitter, 
you had to wear really nice clothes. And it was hard for him. You know, he was just a kid. He didn't have a lot of money for clothes. But in punk, you could wear anything you want. So we saw what Marina and Jenny were wearing, and Sherry, he's just in his bell bottoms and flip flops. <laughs> and he is more punk than anybody else. Not more punk than people I showed, but he's really punk. Okay, so that was Mark, and I was just getting to meet him then. And then I have this other picture of you, and I think that's Gabby Berlin in the um, beret. And then Terry, um, who was the drummer in the bags and gun club and a few other things. But this uh, was the mass benefit, and I like this because he was the only person who actually wore like the bondage clothes from England. He told me a few years ago it was expensive and warm. So, but, um, but it just showed that anything goes. Okay, so when I was photographing at Bump Records, um, there were some other photographers there, and they contacted me and said that I seem to know everyone, and would I invite some people over to take some photos? Later, I showed them my pictures, and he said, your pictures are so much better than mine. And all I could think was they were my friends. They liked posing. They felt comfortable. Yet I still felt really insecure. I mean, I never felt like I was anything. I never got invited anywhere. I very rarely got credit. I didn't get thanked. And I tend to actually have a real low self-esteem anyway, at, particularly then. So I, will, um, I think about that at times. And it's really important when you get compliments and told good things, hold on to them. OK, so. Alice Begg, Belinda, Helen Keller, and Pleasant. This is just how they normally <laughs> dressed. Okay, there's no stylist here. The cat and nine tails, Helen had one. I'm, I assume that's probably hers. This was just everyday wear. Yeah, wow. <laughs> a story I was told by David Jones, who could not be here today, who's a marvelous archivist and who interviewed a great many of us told me that Exine's sister had a store in New York and had some of our photos and clothes and styled people like we were doing, and one of her customers in the late 70s was Madonna. So there's a definite connection between LA and New York, and I worked really hard for the last 40 years next year, and still people think, I'm a New York photographer. It's been, I feel like Sisyphus. It's been really hard. And at this point, I'm kind of like, you know what? Whatever. Um, if people really care, the information's out there, but they prefer to believe whatever they want to believe. So here's with the gun and just a little collage because there were some indoor photos too. And just a night on the street, August. We're just hanging out. And what I love about this is on the right, you see people with their bell bottoms. <laughs> on the left, it was very fashionable to have a satin jacket that had a record company or a big rock and roll group name. So you see somebody with that car that's so 70s, I don't know from cars, I don't even know with cars, and her arm is out in the satin, and there's the punks. Just, and Belinda in her trash can dress and her beret, and um, on the left, we have Terry in his bondage clothes, and Lorna Doom in a raincoat, and Belinda, and Rob? Rob Breaker? Rob, Rob something? That's not Rob. I don't remember his name. I think he played with, no, that's not Rob. Rob is the guy next to Pleasant. I don't know who the guy is with the stripes tie. There's Helen, still looking kind of Sue Catwoman. Then I think that's Rob who played with the germs at the second mass benefit, and all my slides are really washed out. And there's Pleasant. And I'm not sure who's behind her. I don't know if that's Pearl Harbor or Jade or who. I don't know. So anyway, I just really love that juxtaposition. <laughs> Old meets new. Uh -huh. um, oh, this is one of my best-selling photos. People really love dueling guitars. and. Um, the lab lost this slide, uh, negative I mean. So at this point I went digital, this was a few years ago, and I said, oh, I know people want prints from negatives, but they'd come back, that beautiful one of John Denny came back scratched, I'm like, I never had it printed before. So after this strip was lost, but fortunately I do have a high risk scanned. So it's Joan Jett, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
I had pictures of Mark at that first slash benefit, having fun with Joan. She's slapping him because he's saying all kinds of things to her. <laughs> he used to go dancing with her and Cherie at the Sugar Shack. And I love that. I took these pictures. I didn't know all the stories, and I want to know the stories. I love when people tell me the stories. Oh, speaking of which, I have to say this is really important. People, some people don't want me to talk because they only want their version. I'm not just telling my stories. Marina and Jenny have told me a lot. Obviously, Mark has. I've read, and there's a lot of other people not here, and I learned a lot from David Jones' research. I give credit where credit is due. And if people want to argue, and they do, and they say, terrible libelous things about me online. It's like, you know what, I have the photos. You can make it up about what the lineup was or where it was, but these photos don't lie, and the people I quote don't lie. They have good memories, they have no reason to make it up. They're people of integrity. Marina worked at a record company, college educated, incredible character, would never doubt anything she says, and what great memories and what great stories. So anyway, Joan Jett, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> I'm always thrilled when people I photographed and knew got in that. So I used to go to X's apartment, and this was actually, Exena's wearing what um, she, oh, that's because I just added that slide. Yeah, I should rearrange some of these. Um, it's awfully hard to date some of this stuff, and I actually do buy clothes. <laughs> Because people very rarely wore the same thing twice. Only me, because I didn't have money for clothes. It all went into film. So uh, we've got Joan, and we have Exine, and we have Pleasant and Rand, and John Doe. And then what we have that I really love is a thing called a typewriter. Because that's what people used to put fanzines together, and her song lists, and other things. And that's what we used for typewriters. And we would go to the whiskey, and then go over to... X's apartment on La Jolla. So you've got the Starwood at Crescent Heights and uh, Santa Monica, and you go west a little, and you go to Circus Books, which gave rise to adult books. And then you go down south a few doors, and there was this building on La Jolla that X lived in. And I don't know if her next door or same floor or whatever was Plunger Pit with where my Captain Sensible picture was. You have... Um, Trudy and Helen and Mary and a whole bunch of other people. Okay, so I really love that. Okay, so this was a night at the whiskey, and it could have been the same night, too, because of what Joan's wearing, and we see that this could have been the same. So that other picture was out of order. But Farrah is wearing like a Halloween costume of a nurse, and Joan Jett's blowing gum. How precious is that? My favorite spot in the whole world was that stairways. I could stand on that stair, and there was a certain spot I stood all the time and took pictures. I loved it more than anywhere in the world. More than the mask and the starwood and the, oh, I hated the forum and the civic and all these places that made it so freaking hard to take photos. You have no idea how hard it was. People would be walking up and down all night and be bouncing up and down. I'd be ah, yeah, yeah, dancing and singing, click, click, click. And one of um, Patty's managers, I wasn't photographing Patty there, but I was showing him some photos of whomever I photographed. He goes, every time I saw you last night, you were just the hands in the air and jumping up and down and dancing. Where'd you, there's a lot of photos here and they're all really good and they're all in focus. How'd you do that? Magic. Okay, so um, it is, I firmly believe it's, you know, what you focus upon expands. And um, it's just, it is. You, it's it, not to be too new agey, but I am, and I've always been. It's just this thing I always felt, even in college, my whole life making art, um, that I was just tuned in to this energy, this cosmic consciousness and energy. And I really felt that at that time. And um, that was fun when I was taking the pictures. The rest of it wasn't necessarily fun. So after that, we went over to X's apartment. Now, I wrote to Farah, whose real name is Faye, because this looks like, the poster looks like Sylvia Plath. But she said, I don't know. I don't think there are any posters of Sylvia Plath in 1977. So I'm over at X's apartment. And OK, you remember? She's the one who hated the N-word and Jews. So she used to, Farah would stop me. And she'd be right in front of me. And Exine would be to my left staring at me with those eyes. If you read Devil Doll, the lyrics, hear the song, but she stares at you with her eyes or whatever. I can tell you, I can't quote songs. Okay. Um, Farrah would say, 
quote unquote, Hitler was right, Jews should be burned, and then she would always say something else, unquote. But I only heard that part because I would just try to keep my composure as my eyes filled with tears and I would try not to shake because I always knew anti-Semitism and it, I'm not that much Jewish. I can't even find a temple to go to. I was raised really, really, really liberal. And it's not the holidays, it's the meaning behind it. It's about, there's an old saying about how one candle lighting others doesn't diminish or something. It's just a way of living and thinking and it's not really dealing with religion. It's more the morals and the ethics and the huge importance on education and culture. It is what kept Jews alive, education and culture. My parents, my mother used to tell me that all the time. Anyway, and my grand mother on my mother's side escaped the pogrom if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof. That's my family story. And she told me her father lost family in the Holocaust. So, um, but you just always feel anti-Semitism and, but I never had it in my face before. So one night she's got a chicken breast in one arm and a beer bottle in the other and she's shoving it in my face, calling me all these names, Jenny this, Jenny that, Jenny Lenz. And I love telling this story because you never know what good will come from somebody trying to give you a hard time. And I have a really happy ending to this. She's a meditating Buddhist, a life coach. She just returned back to Florida, and we are friends. And she wished me success today. And I really appreciate that. And I used to post this story years ago before Facebook, and KK wrote me and goes, Jenny, why are you so hateful? I said, I'm not hateful. This is just true. She used to say this, but I always thanked her. I always did. And there was a time, too, I think in the 80s when she would be going, or maybe 90s, going to an ex show, and I couldn't go because she was going. So it's really cool that we're friends now. And we really have great respect. And I actually want to Skype her and talk to her. So, Jenny Stern. Oh, my name was Jenny Stern. And this is the invitation to Ferris goodbye party. And Exine put this together. So I, ha I had kept it on the wall. It's very yellowed. And that's the back. Nightmare going away party, Ferris. <laughs> Was that fun? Oh, I have a story about that. A few years ago, Brendan told me that he didn't realize there was any kind of a scene going on, this punk scene, until this night, September 17th, 1977. And I have pictures of him at the party. And he saw all these people and realized something was going down. OK. But afterwards, uh, I wasn't drinking when I was taking pictures. but. Usually when you drink, you get a little hungry. So people went over to Denny's on Hollywood Boulevard, and they weren't seating us. I was having fun, taking pictures, because at the party, black and white, now we're color, I'm having fun. And Tamara leans over to me, and he goes, they won't seat us. Well, yeah, Sherry was wearing a bra that didn't, her nipples were exposed, you know. <laughs> 1977, people just didn't do that in public. And I love that um, Helen has turquoise hair and Mary has lavender and there's Kid Congo is leaning over and on the sofa is Tamata, Helen, and Tony the Tiger. And um, these people all were very special to me because we just all hung out together. In fact, I became known for my germs photos. I never liked Darby or the germs. <laughs> but, we all, I hung out with Sherry because I love what she was wearing and Helen and Trudy and the rest and that's where Lorna and Darby were and so I <laughs> took all these germs photos because I liked the fashions of their friends. Oh, speaking of which. So we have the germs at the mask uh, November 23rd, 1977 and I picture, he was wearing a t-shirt that said Frampton comes alive. <laughs> Seriously. And um, so I have pictures of him cutting himself with a broken beer bottle. And the one on the right has become just really classic. I'm like, okay. Um, oh, so at the end of the year, I photographed this man, whom I have no respect for. I have no respect for any man who goes around telling young women their dog meat. I would seek him foully and stand as far away from him as I could, but I did take a few photos. I know people who love him. They go out to Palm Springs. He gives them records and all kinds of stuff. He walks on water. He's like, fuck 
him. You do not talk to people that way. Oh, thank you. And then, of course, I saw um, Edge play, and that was pretty re revelatory, but not really that surprising. And he sabotaged Rodney's documentary that broke their friendship. He was awful. And that little girl next to him, jumped in, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I love it. And that's in the same place where I photographed Blondie. The most difficult show I ever shot. When Johnny Rotten said at the end of the Pistols show in San Francisco, now again, me with the quotes, you have a feeling you've ever been cheated? And what I always say, and I say this to Jonesy, doesn't pay any attention to me, they were cheated. Now come on, shouldn't the Pistols have played in LA? Come on. Malcolm was here. I have pictures of Malcolm at the Ramones in 76. I have pictures of Malcolm at the Mask Benefit. Oh, which would actually be right after that, because that's February 78. He came out checking out what was here. We had Rory, you know, his right-hand man, Rory Johnston. To go to Bill Graham's Winterland? Fuck Malcolm. I know that there are people who think that Malcolm McLaren is really great. Ah, I do not forgive him for not having them play in LA. This is where punk was. Now, I love San Francisco, and the San Francisco scene has not gotten their credit. But come on, really? So anyway, this was really hard. It was cold and wet, waiting out line. I was standing on a skinny photo box being knocked over. But I took a ton of really good photos, which totally blew my mind. But ugh, such so hard. It was a tough, tough show. Hmm. And opening for them in the center were the Avengers, that's Penelope. And I'm not sure if the one on the left is the Mubuhe. You know, sometimes I went to places that were one-offs. I shot the motels a lot in fall of 76. Yeah, I have no idea where I was, you know. I look at it and go, where was this? Um, and on the right, that is Valentine's Day, February 78, the whiskey. The mask benefit. I'm not sure which, but one of these photos is in the Smithsonian. So Alice Bag um, is this huge icon because she's just wonderful. Uh, she's heralded in the Chicano Latino community as well as punk. Some people consider her the first hardcore singer. To me, she wasn't any of that stuff because I never saw the bags other than this one night. To me, she was just a beautiful, wonderful, kind woman whom I loved photographing, who once did a favor that literally saved my life. So that's Alice. So um, they needed a photo, and it's in the Smithsonian. <whistles> nice. And I'm so proud of her and so happy for her. So this was at the Mass Benefit. And I think that Nikki Beat probably made the belt. He was making a lot of vinyl belts. Uh, this is backstage at the Whiskey. Uh, doing some fashion things here, the Randettes. One of my most favorite photos of all time, because again, no stylist. These women went to thrift stores and put these looks together themselves, and they perfectly encapsulated time frames. Connie Clarksville with her white bow and the teased hair, so Annette Funicello. My hair was like that, only it's really hard to have bangs, but I tried, because um, my hair's so curly. Yeah, and then Alice, Carnaby Street, please, Mary Quant. And then, I'm not sure, is the designer Prada with uh, Sheila in the back and Trudy on the left, the colorful dresses? I mean, they're just wild, wild, wild. And there's, so on the bottom left, we have um, Trudy. Oh, I think Mark told me this. He goes, with the gang, with they're holding, both Trudy and KK are holding their fingers up. And Mark goes, you know, we had gang signals in LA before they did in New York. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we have Trudy and she, um, Trixie, and Exine sitting on KK's lap. And then on the left, we had Sheila, who used to often performed with the Screamers. I have amazing photos of that, but not here because there's not enough time. Connie, Spaz. I would love to know what happened to Spaz Attack. I have Gorgeous photos of Spaz. He was amazing. He was in Blade Runner. He's in one of the promo pictures with whoever was the star of that. And Alice Bag and Nikki Beat. And I also love all the graffiti back there. Ah. So I'm talking to Exine's sister and saying, I really love your jewelry. And you can't see her bracelets, but she has these skulls and then the eight balls. And she said she made them. I did not realize she had this store. And I just love this photo of the two of them, and 
I'm the last person to photograph her alive. And when Exine came back from her funeral, I gave her prints. Um, she was visiting, this was 78, so that would have been two years later in April 80, and she was killed on her way over to an ex show. And I didn't go that night, I'd gone the night before and photographed her. So Exine and her sister, riding with Mary. Okay, Johnny Rotten, Joan Jett. Um, an, another version that was in, cre in, in Rolling Stone, I decided that I wanted to throw in a little press. I was on the masthead at Cream, <laughs> the best rock and roll magazine. Way better than Rolling Stone. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, this was, this, I've actually sold this, and this, I think, made it into the Danger House box set. It was supposed to be the cover, but they went with Michael Yampolsky's picture of Geza X, which is wonderful. I love Michael Yampolsky's photos. He had a really good camera. And he knew what he was doing, and he developed his own film, and he was an artist and had a whole style. And he took very much art photos. Me, it was just casual. I didn't like to pose or anything, pose people. Um, let them do their own thing. Okay. Oh, I just remember this. Hal told me. Um, I, was trying to, I almost had his real first name. I forgot. Marty Greenberg. Yes, Marty. Green, Green? Goldstein? Goldberg? <laughs> I feel like an auction. Do we have a Marty? Do we have a Gold? Do we have a Berg? <laughs> Thank you all. I love it. I cannot do all of this myself. He told me that John Denny painted this jacket. I just remembered that. Oh, I think he told David Jones who told me. One of the two told me. Whatever. Devo. I really love Devo. These are really rare photos. Uh, this was July 78, one night they dressed as spuds and they have trash bags. And oh, there's an exhibit that's in the museum, uh, Denver Museum of Contemporary Art right now of Mark Mothersbaugh's art. And they have these photos. I think all three of them. I don't know. I can't keep track of what goes where, but I know it's there. It's coming to the Santa Monica Museum of Art because there was just this exhibit with um, my photos at, uh, for Dee Dee Ramone in New York at the Hotel Chelsea because it's a new Fender base in honor of Dee Dee. And I have a whole wall, but um, I don't have any photos of it. So it's nice when things are coming to LA. Mm, okay, not a lot has, I talked to Lorna about this. Not a lot has been written about the affection between Lorna and Darby, the friendship. And I see it over and over again in my photos. And it's really evident here. And this is at the mask benefit. And I put it next to something that's out of order because <laughs> they look good together. And this photo was uh, the screamers were playing the Stardust Ballroom. And it's Alice Bag, And Alice doesn't know who is in the center. And I used to be really, you know, things were noisy. And I couldn't hear people's names. And I have a hard time remembering. So I was too embarrassed to ask people their names. Now I do, because I learned, don't be embarrassed. And Chase Holiday, And I just love what they're wearing, the styles. They're so stylish. Thrift store, all on their own. And yet, you know, when the Metropolitan did their exhibit, was any of this in there? No. What the fuck did they know? They don't even want to know. Oh, I threw this in because I'm very proud of the fact that I photographed the Rolling Stones, and this photo was in Guitar World. And I know people go, eh, eh. And I'm like, the Stones, my god, how amazing. I flew to Houston, it was crazy. Oh, more dueling guitars, oh, is that beautiful? Oh. And, and Mick looking like a statue. It was just, that's why I like this art photo, there's just a statue. Oh. And Keith looking so baby-faced on one hand and then just, pfft, his, you know, Keith and his attitude, and puffing smoke just out there. Then I snuck in backstage at the Burbank Amphitheater and photographed um, the guy on the left, Bob Marley. Okay, the summer of 76, before I shot the Ramones, I used to go to Anaheim Stadium. I saw Aerosmith. I saw ZZ Top. Ugh. I saw The Who. And I never dreamt that two years later I would be on stage at Anaheim Stadium because I knew somebody who knew Peter Tosh and he was opening for the Stones. So that was a real thrill and I love that he turned around so I could see him but in front of 60,000 people. Awesome. Trixie again and Tom waits. I'm not real sure where this was but I just love it and just give one of those spontaneous things that you know people would. I made up my face. We all made up our face. It's cool. Oh more about the photo thing. Oh I love this band. I heard I don't like Mondays. 
before most of the rest of the world. And it was just Bob Geldof, Sir Bob, and Johnny Fingers, and I love it much better than the big symphonic version they have now. And a few months after that, Faulkner O'Connor, is his name Faulkner Kelly? Whatever, Faulkner, handed me, and he wrote on this, it was the 45 of I Don't Like Mondays, and he thanked me for all my support in loving the band. And the Boomtown Rats were amazing, and punk bands were not well lit. We got white light. How boring is that? This was brilliant. They were at the Coconut Grove, and they had colored lights. They were also at Fredericks of Hollywood, but that's not here. And so I included because I just love the color and I love the show. So after the Mass Benefit, which was in 78, there was another show of the punks on St. Patrick's Day, 79. And it's very infamous because out of nowhere, the police, the Go-Go's were playing. It was a really, you know, people were sitting around the stairs. And I have all these photos at the Mass Benefit of people at the stairs. We were all hanging out. But a year later, the cops came in in the riot gear and just started beating up people. And they call it the St. Patrick's Day riot. So the next day, we met at the mask for a press conference. And you could just see in their faces, there's sadness and fear and disappointment and anger and frustration, the scene had definitely changed. I felt that the scene really changed by February 78 when the mask was closed and the pistols imploded. There was definitely a shift and I just love how everybody is saying so much in their face and just looking straight at me. Then we went to a party um, on May 28th, 1978 Nine, and it was a birthday party for Liera on the left and Tamara and Liera's sister Chase. And there was very unusual to see punks out during the day. I have all these great photos. They're wonderful color. And you see Brendan, he's got like this zebra stripe collar. And um, the girls are all wearing prom dresses from the 50s with chiffon. And this guy comes in this park with this tame wild bird. And the way that Tamara is looking with this inquisitiveness and that's the way Tomato was. He just soaked everything in. I just love that photo. You know, it's hard. Some of these photos I love because I love the people, and then other times I just love it for the um, artistry of it. Although I usually crop the left side. I wasn't sleepy much. I'd like it when it's a little more cropped. Okay, this is the artist in me. I'm always talking about that. Mark knows that. Mark helped me with my book. Oh, my God. Punk Pioneers. Oh, let's just crop this over here. Let's move this up here. Let's. I'm just, you know. Okay. Beautiful Lady Michelle, who's been so very supportive and encouraged me. She gave me a card, which I have in a little plastic frame, but I have it usually sitting on top of my printer. I was printing this week, but I'll put it back there. And it's about oh, something about a dream, letting a luminous dream light your life. Oh, my God, quotes. I look at it about a million times a day, but I love it. And she, and I still have one. I'm going to go see Into the Woods because she gave me like two or three years ago two movie passes. I saw Grand Budapest Hotel. That was awesome. I have loved Stephen Sondheim since Company played here in 1970, 71 or so, and I've been listening to Into the Woods since, what, 1985 or something, but I've been too busy to go see it. But I'm going to use my ticket. Don't, don't see it or do see it. Oh, yeah, okay, because I know it's different. I've seen some reviews and stuff and things, but... Okay, some of you name your favorite punk band. My favorite punk is Stephen Sondheim. <gasps> He's so awesome. You know, Tony, Tony, Tony from West Side Story. He wrote that. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen. I love him. So Michelle on the right. I don't. Do you know who was on the left here? Her name, Jenny. Jenny. Jen. Well, thank you. Well, I had a Polaroid camera. And I used to ask people to stand on my bed, which was my sofa in my apartment, and up against, my, up against the wall. And I even have a note. I see my handwriting. I don't know what it says. And I take a Polaroid. Yeah, so thank you. I was in this apartment that was around the corner from where Buck's, Buck Soup. Try Buck Soup. And across the street from Tower Records, and just a couple blocks, or a few blocks east of the Whiskey and the Roxy, which was a really great place to, to live. Okay, and I wanted to throw this in because um, these are really important people. On the left is Alejandro, and on the right is Javier Escovedo, and um, they're part of this famous music group, Sheila E's, 
related to them. I guess the E is for Escovito. And um, I know that Alejandro is still performing, and as his shirt says, he was in the nuns, and Javier was in the Zeros, who were called the Mexican Ramones. And they were these cute little teenagers from down near San Diego who came up here, and one of them, Robert Lopez, became Elvis. He will marry you, not to you, but another couple? Yeah, and he puts on this incredible review. It's wonderful, it's a wonderful Las Vegas review. Okay, so I was banned from seeing Blondie, but Debbie didn't have a problem with me. So I went to the dress rehearsal when Blondie was on American Bandstand, but Debbie told me that you know once they started taping and Peter Leeds would show up, I had to leave, which was actually really good because I love this photo, it's so awesome. Because when do you get to see behind the scenes stuff? I love it, I love the guys moving the gear. I love Dick Clark smiling and talking to Debbie, getting a little introduced to them. I love Nigel and Chris with their arms around each other. It's just, and I got the logo, yay! It's just perfect. I didn't even need to stay around for any others. That's awesome. Oh, and people really like this photo. I was invited out to Shangri-La Studios to photograph. Ricky Lee Jones was doing a demo for Chucky Weiss, and she had that hit, Chucky's in Love. And I just took this casual photo that has been published and sold a lot. When I say a lot, I mean like there's four people who bought a print. It's not like I sell hundreds. People think I'm really rich. You know, the Runaways, I've sold like six of them, but, and that's my best selling. So. <laughs> but um, it's very 70s. Pinball machine, teacher's pet, Doris Day. Okay. Um, I have a lot of memorabilia. I just don't have time to scan it all, and I need a new scanner, a new computer. But this is X song list, and from my notes said it was Club 88 from July 28, 1979. But I really love this. Exine wrote, Year One, I'm One. Love, Jenny, Exine. And that's one of my favorite songs. I really love that. And to Jenny with love from Billy Zoom. And Top Jimmy. Cool, because I really like Tom Jimmy. Mr. Rock and Roll. Okay. He has not gotten his due. This man is, you know, he's amazing. So I got a photo pass, and I'm sitting up, because they always had seats there for the most part, except for B-52s, which they wouldn't let us take pictures, but I danced with Tomato, but usually have seats. He comes out. He's doing his famous duck walk. I take this picture, I license it to William Morris for $35 in like 1979. Throughout the whole 80s, I see it all over in ads and editorials. <sighs> Should have been paid a lot more, but nonetheless, it's Chuck Berry, man. Johnny B. Good and oh, Maybelline. I mean, this guy, he just, and I'm backstage and he's introducing me to his daughter and I'm taking pictures. Nice guy. And there's all these punks who think they're such hot shit. And this man treats me better than all of them put together. He was amazing. God bless you, Chuck Berry. All right. Oh, this is a really fun band, Champ 69. They um, were British and hung out but never got their due. And I'm going to go quickly because they're running out of time here. Uh, the Germs, X, Suburban Lawn. Yeah. So how many were at that show? The Hope Street Hall? So, yeah, and the X song, but I like this because John writes for Jenny, it's been a long time since La Jolla, et cetera, but thanks for all the support. So that goes back to the story of La Jolla. And then Exine writes, hi, Jenny, see you at the mask tomorrow. There's no freaking mask in 1979. It's a joke, but I really love it. And then Billy says to Jenny with the Ginchy dress, thanks, Billy Zoom, because I was wearing rockabilly dress. And I loved Ultravox, and I didn't do anything special, came right out of the camera. We're coming into 1980, we're coming towards the end. Uh, this, I still have the flyer for this, the St. Valentine's Surreal Party at the Wilton Hilton, which is where the Screamers used to live. Jeffrey the Gun Club. I'm so very proud of these people, and I have to say that Belinda Carlisle is probably the nicest person in punk to me today. Um, really sweet, and we keep in touch, and she enabled me to see the Go-Go's at the Hollywood Bowl. Isn't that cool? All of us who knew these girls, Jane, Gina, Charlotte, Margot. Let's hear it from Margot. I loved Margot. Sweetest girl. Funny, always smile. Look at the smile. 
could she dress? I have pictures of her at the Mass Benefit to Die For. She was adorable. And I just, again, I just loved people who were really creative, and she was just so much fun. And then Belinda, and she used some, in fact, it's in Belinda's memoir, all the punk pictures, inside and outside, are mine, except when they go to Kathy Valentine, but that's a whole different era. That's a different sound. Um, so I was really pleased that she reached out to me because so many people don't. Um, yeah. Oh, the taping of Decline of Western Civilization at Club 88. So this one's been used, Rhino's used it, and the one on the right, Exine used on the cover of a CD set, Live at the Mask, and it's become really, really iconic, and then John and Exine. But this one actually, the reason I love this, this is X. They really felt it. They were just so amazing to watch in those days. And I love their songs. And I feel it's because it was a man and a woman. You really get the woman's point of view. You also get noir. I mean, they read the books. I saw the movies. The dark underbelly, sugar light, sugar light. My arm is tied off waiting to burn it down. I remember being in the Starwood and John was introducing sugar light. And he says, you know what it's like at 2 and 3 in the morning and you're all wired on speed and you go to the donut shop across the street and the cops are hanging out? because there was a windshield across the street. It's like, uh-huh, we all were on speed. Well, a great many of us were on something, but <laughs> can you imagine me on speed? Woo! <laughs> I was scary. Mark is laughing. He knows. <laughs> I, I have these date books, which help me figure some of this out. And it goes back to 76. And when you get to 79, they're filled with all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it was crazy times. So sugar light, sugar light, yeah. The city of electric lights, swallowing one bulb after another in the city of electric lights. I mean, I just love them so much. This was used on Rhino's cover. They just cropped Exine um, for the We're Desperate. And during the filming of Decline, I was photographing these, and Exine's pointing to these. And there's actually a brochure that says Beyond and Back. OK, I want to go to England because the go-go's are there. X is going to go. And I knew it was the end. I was broke. I was burned out. I was strung on speed. It was time to go. The scene had changed. It was moving all over the city. I could not continue this lifestyle. But the Clash were playing in England, and I had to see them on their home turf. I had to. And I love this photo in this pub because John is, has the thumb up, and Exine's wearing this jacket that has a hand going down. And the way that they're juxtaposed, I didn't arrange that. That was totally spontaneous. I didn't even see it till it was scanned. And then, let's hear it for Claude, Kickboy, Bessie. Claude was, to, in my estimation, the voice of L.A. punk. He's the best thing of, on decline of Western civilization. He's hysterical. He was the lead singer of the band. He created Catholic Discipline. And he was just so in your face. And he was so wonderful. And he was wild. Um, oh, two of my most treasured friends, mm -hmm. Claude and Margot. And this may have been, yeah, I think it was in London with, with the Polaroid, because at that point, Claude and Philomena had um, left L.A. He'd had enough of L.A. And <laughs> there's Faye Hart, Farrah Fawcett Miners on the right, and Darby wearing his Adam Ant mohawk. And he's staring at Amanda Donahoe. When I did the book, I, did, I kept looking at his face going, who is this? And after the book was published, a friend of mine told me. He said, you know, she's an actress in Lair of the White Worm, and she was also in L.A. Law and a lot of other things. She was good, really good friends with Jordan, and Jordan was the big style icon in England. But I love the way Darby's looking at them. Oh, Ginger Canzanieri. Ginger Canzanieri and I both went to Cal Arts. There was Judy Chicago. That's a whole other story. I was involved in Judy Chicago's dinner party, and I gave it up for punk. And um, Judy had a, a class uh, on feminist art on in uh, bleh, Cal Arts, and there was an exhibit, and she invited me to hang something I had made, even though I wasn't in her program. And I took a photo of a painting of cupcakes and camels, because I love the colors. Ginger Canzanieri painted that. And it's just an amazing thing to find that out a few years later. Because I see, when I was in school, got my degree in 74, and I took this in 80. So I probably shot it 73, 74, probably. Hmm. 
Okay, so um, that's me. My hair always photographed red, but it was magenta. This, this is my Ginchy dress, my little rockabilly dress that I bought at a thrift store. And <laughs> my reaction to getting my photo taken. I had all these wonderful buttons, Go-Go's buttons, and X, which were stolen when I moved out of Hollywood. I, stuff got lost. The point of this one is like my face was really pimply because I'd been doing all kinds of drugs and eating badly and whatnot and your skin is the largest organ of elimination and it's this thing about you know we always think that we have to be skinny and pretty and this and that and all this stuff and it's like no we just have to do the work just have to do it. Oh the very end clash I'm gonna go through this quickly this is clash backstage at March 3rd 1980 and this is their debut February 79 this is England. This is why I went to England. I wanted to be on balconies to look at them because there wasn't anything like that in LA. They were amazing. I have all these slides where they're backlit and oh, they're so gorgeous. This is just a so-so, but I want to throw it in. This was Sandy, October 1979, and then I went home that night with Johnny Green, who is their main roadie, whose fiance and future wife was on tour with them, and he abandoned her to have wild sex with me. <laughs> And then he gets up and he has to leave because it's sound check and nobody can find him. So then he says, give me a list of names for your friends to be on the guest list. Do you think I have anybody's last name or phone number? So I get my dear friend Mark Martinez in and he puts the pass on his sleeve on his shirt and during the show, somebody literally rips off the sleeve. Fun times. Okay. Um, oh, the Santa Monica Civic. Yeah. And, and I just... Ugh. My favorite band to photograph or see, they were just, I'm a very political animal. You know, what Joe Strummer sang about. People love The Clash, and yet they won't do anything about what's going on in politics. They won't even share or make comments about political things on Facebook. I always say that. I go, I put up a picture of the Go-Go's. I get 70 likes. I put up something major about net neutrality or Ferguson, and I get two likes. I go, you say you like the, the Clash. What do you think Joe Strummer was singing about? Yikes. So anyway, I love them. Yeah. Um, I love this, that they're talking to each other, Joe and Mick, and smiling. How sweet. Oh, that was the other thing. No band ever did this. They ran around on stage with each other. They didn't plant themselves in one spot. They really related to each other. It was amazing. Oh, I was on stage in England, and this is so phenomenal. I love the girl up front, deep in thought, the looks on people's faces, and the look on shows. Oh, I love that. And I love this one. Ah, you can see this vein. I have several shots of him where the vein down the center of his forehead is just popping out. And then there's this guy clasping his hands like he's praying and he's got his eyes closed. I mean, people were just really listening to them. They were that magical. And in England, they let the, the fans come up on stage. I have all these pictures. I don't think I included more of those. But are these group shots were... <laughs> They're up on stage. Amazing. And there, there's Joe with the, also on the left. You, you can see it, um, the vein. And then more in England. Ugh, and the way he's just screaming, man, we mean it. And Mick. Okay, so I'm backstage at Blue Oyster Cult in, that's what it says, August 10th, 1978. Um, and I see Mick. And he is hot. He's got this wavy, thick, dark hair, and he's just dressed great. And it's not a great scan. It's, you know, it's a red vest. It's always red, black, and white. And he's just, I mean, I love the men. I love the London men, but I love them. They're dark, dark, I like dark. And I could barely control myself. And I was taking a few pictures. And later, he denied they're ever going to Blue Oyster Cult show. It's like, I have the pictures. But he also, I read this recently because I was reading some Clash books because I want to work on a project with my photos and I just needed some dates and things. Um, the group made him cut his hair off because it wasn't punk. Oh. He's plenty punk there. Okay, the other sex symbol of the band, uh, Paul, whom I call the golden god. Yeah, okay. So that's we're done. Love you. I love you, Jenny Lenz. You're awesome. And Jenny, I just want to say, you, I, 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 I don't know, I'm sorry that on the ride over, I was saying, don't go on too many tangents. I apologize. I love your tangents.
<laughs> okay, love your tangents. Now, you're Michelle, right? First of all, Jenny, thank you so much for doing this. It was fabulous. Such a walk down memory lane, so thank you. And um, I just, I don't have a question. I just want to say, those little packages of the cards. She bought four. They're so fabulous. Everybody should get them. They're fabulous. Thank you, Love Michelle. You. Thank you. Well, I messed up somehow when I sent it off. I ordered three, and so I wrote her, and I go, you're going to get two packages, because I, I know nobody else ordered four. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, this Wendy's been working I'm hard. Sorry. She'll take care of everyone. <laughs> All right, Jennifer. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, Jenny. How are you? I am Great fine. Great presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. I wanted to ask you, when the 80s turned around and hardcore came into Los Angeles, were you continuing to photograph? Oh, that, what happened that, with you? That's a really good question. Well, that's why I ended as the clash. I was not paid. What I did to make money, it's kind of out there on the internet, but I'm not going to publicize it. I see some giggles. No, Do look it. at Michelle going, mm -mm 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 -mm. there's some places we don't go. By the way, hi, Gary. Nice to see you. Okay, um, take my photo, Gary Leonard. Woohoo! Thank you. But to answer this really important question is that I was not invited to shows. It was hard to find out about anything. I had to beg to get into many shows. Uh, my Photos were published everywhere without credit, without payment, and, you know, four years of that. And um, feeling not very appreciated and not having the money to, for gas to drive around town, not even knowing. There are people on the east side who feel like I deliberately snubbed them. They never invited me. I didn't even know anything was going on there, you know? You think anybody ever paid for a roll of film? <laughs> anything? You know, if you were a writer, Marina knows this. You got a you got a plus one in a tab. You could drink and bring your friend. Me carrying around all the equipment. I had to beg to get Mark to come in because he helped me. Mark helped me hand roll film. Oh, we had to, oh <laughs> we had so much fun, and um, yeah. So there's no money and no appreciation. And now it's all spread out. It's out in the South Bay. It's in Orange County. Hardcore. I'm wearing sandals. I used to wear Birkenstocks and Fiorucci jellies. You know, I'm five foot five or something. Uh, <laughs> All the guys have motorcycle boots. I don't really want... I hated the music. I hated what they were wearing. I hated hardcore. It was time to leave. It was just time. And um, I knew that it would be short. You know, I spent four years, and that was it. It was time to move on. I really wanted, always wanted to be a movie, video, bleh, a movie director, and if I stayed around, I could have done video. But people tell me now that I was really famous. But I did not know that. Nobody ever told me that then. So, you know, but I also think that it was probably good that I left because emotionally it was time to leave. If I'd stayed in Hollywood, I, I don't know what would have happened. It might not have been good. So we all, you know, you choose a path and you stick with it and you make the most of it. And I'm just really grateful that I did what I did in the 80s. I started to learn computer technology. That was important to me. We got pictures back from Saturn and Jupiter, and it's like, I know they're not throwing canisters of little film down there. What is this computer stuff? I worked really hard to get back to be able to go to school and study computer graphics, which I taught throughout the 90s and want to get back into doing. Computers have saved my life. I love them. I love website design and create. I don't like to do the programming, but I do it. Boom. Um, social media and all the wonder there's many 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 things I've done with my pictures besides this which gets a lot boring but it's wonderful and the topography Mark hired me to work with him on the kennel review we did graphic design in the early days of electronic typesetting and um, I got to see a lot of old movies and things and I was married for way too long badly um, so I did all that instead and that brought me to where I am now and who knows what would have happened with the, Holly was crazy. It's difficult. I was reading about Amanda Donahoe because I needed to know how to spell her name, and she had to leave Hollywood. You just, it's a tough town. It's a tough town. It's amazing that somebody as shy and prefers solitude and prefers being by myself and loves digging into books and movies actually has this social life like I have, that I managed to do what I did in four years. Um, so I was enough. If anybody ever thanked me or paid me, it might have been different. So hardcore. Blech. 
Any other questions? <laughs> Well, there's one I won't, how I raised money for my film towards the end. No, look at Michelle's face. We do, we do not go there. <laughs> Mark, where are you? I don't I know where here. I stuck you I earlier today. I have a question today. for you. Uh-huh. <clears throat> what you did at that time, as many of the other people that did it at that time, it was just for, you went out, you had a good time, you took your photographs. When some of these bands got labeled uh, or got signed to a label, how difficult was it for you to be able to do what you did before they became famous and work with them and get paid with their record label? Well, Mark is asking an interesting question, and uh, my answer to this, when you brought this up, was <sighs> Melanie Nissen once said this to me. We were at the Santa Monica Civic, and Diva was playing. Slash Magazine ran articles about Devo. They had a party for Devo, okay? When Devo was signed to Warner Brothers, did Warner Brothers buy an ad in Slash for Devo or anybody? No. That happened to me too. So people would get signed, or I would see them at the clubs drinking all night, and they always had different clothes, so obviously they had some money. Did they ever... Oh my God, Alice is here. <laughs> Alice and Greg, oh my God. I know I'm talking about Mark, but we'll get there. But you know, this is what keeps me going is, you know, there's all this, oh God, bless. oh, she's in February 78. Oh my God. Oh, well, we have to talk. Um, okay, let me, let me do this and I'll answer it because I like having some pictures of the people who are speaking. So, right there, okay. So, um, and I remember this, I was at a Devo show, and I think it might have been the Civic, and I said that to Melanie, I go, aren't you proud, aren't you happy? Look what you've done for Devo. Yeah, you think that Warner Brothers would pay for an ad. And we had the Slash Magazine benefits so they could print it, because not, most of us didn't pay for it, right? And they just had to pay the printing costs. So people had money for clothes, they had money for booze, they had money for drugs, and they would get signed or a manager or whatever, what, was I ever hired? Did they ever come to me and say, this woman has these photos, just use them? Send them out to the magazines, the magazines would pay me, okay? Did they ever do that, one of them? <sighs> David Jones told me that the Screamers were the first unsigned band to play the rock scene. They got that gig in no small part because of my photos in Cream Magazine and Music Life, which was huge in Japan. I asked them for three days, was I on the list? I was the last person added to the list, and I was one of the main people who helped them get that gig. I was backstage at that gig talking to Tamada and said that Tommy Gear reminded me of Antonin Artaud. I took two years of French, but I could never speak it. My teacher told me never to speak it again. I could write it perfectly. I have this incredible photographic memory um, to the, down to the comma and the period. But, okay, Arto, Antony Arto, uh, who created the theater of the absurd. And I had seen pictures of him because yeah, I studied art history and movie history in Passion of Joan of Arc, um, the Carl Dreyer classic silent film. So I see Tommy in the doorway. Because Tamata says, you should tell Tommy he really loves our toe. So I see Tommy in the doorway, and I say, you know, I just mentioned to Tamata that you remind me a lot of Antonin Artaud. Tommy looked at me the way he always did, as if I were not there, and just walked away. Oh, yeah. No, I got no love from the bands, and as far as... But once bands were signed, oh my God, I used to cry. I remember trying to get in to see, photograph Greg Kinn um, at the Roxy and on my knees crying, going, but I'm a photographer, I get published and all that. It was very hard to get passes, with one exception, and I love this story. I get on a plane, Darla Hitchcock drove me, we're Facebook friends, and we're friends back then, she was a punk, and she used to make beautiful clothes, she still does like for Renaissance Fair and things. She drove me down to LAX, 
I got on a plane, got off on Heathrow, dropped my luggage off at either NME or New Musical Express, or maybe that's the same thing, uh, Melody, whatever, I dropped my luggage off, somehow found a bus to a train to Bristol. I get there at night, I have no idea how I did this from the train. I get to the venue where the Clash are playing, they're on stage, I tell the people at the box office, I just flew in from LA to photograph the Clash, they let me in. Do you think that would happen in LA? Alice is shaking her head, she knows, no way. Not only that, when I get in there, because you know it's dark, and there's all these cords and things on the stage, a, some kind of little pipe pierced uh, my left to right shin, my leg, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't get any medical treatment for a while. I got a ride home. There's stories between the Clash roadies and myself. So I got a ride home with one of the Clash roadies who had thrown me out from the Civic in March, who wanted to tell me his whole love life and then make love to me. And I'm like, ah, that's really nice, but you know, I haven't slept since LA. What time is it? And so I ran around with them for a few days doing some errands with the Clash, and then finally I had some downtime, and I went to the hospital, and I waited four hours because I need antibiotic because I get infections if I don't have antibiotic. And they apologized for making me wait, and I got free antibiotic. That's socialized medicine that's so horrible. So, um, so the hospital stuff wouldn't happen in LA, and the shows wouldn't happen. So uh, you would think that the magazines and the record companies would contact me a few times. One time, I can't remember his name, some producer was backstage at the Roxy and since I live close by, they called me and I took pictures. Another time I was asked to go photograph Queen with some Electra record company people. I think they're on Electra. Yeah, um, at a hotel in Beverly Hills. I have two little autograph books. So I asked for autographs and the next day I got a phone call from the record company, never asked Freddie Mercury for his autograph. <laughs> but guess what? He's dead and I'm still here. <laughs> so, you know, living well is the best revenge. But anyway, Alice Bag is in the house, folks. <laughs> you want to stand up, Alice? Please? Oh, she's got blue hair. <laughs> and her wonderful husband, Greg, is next to her. I. I don't think I've seen you since Silver Lake when I had an article about punk in, I don't know, Mojo, one of the British magazines. I remember Darby was the opening. I'm not sure. I think I might have had pictures of you, Alice, but I'm not sure. But I'm just thrilled that people who came today did, that some of my very dearest friends. And I went to the wake for Randy Kay, and I did not talk, email Brad Dunning because I have to find his email. But I said, you know, we never get together except when people are dead. Are we going to get together when I die? Are we going to get together sooner? So I would really love some kind of little get together that isn't like music, but we just sit around and talk and invite other people too. And then I'm not the only person talking. But um, is <laughs> yes, I think is Wendy got that we've got a hand up over here. Ashley. We have, we have time for one more question, but before I hand the mic over, I just uh -huh. want to say we are, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but that we are having, and I hope you check this out, Jenny, uh, we are having an exhibit uh, that's ongoing for six months down in lower level four history department. It's called From Pop to the oh Pit. And there are 31 images that I curated from the Herald Examiner <sighs> archives on the LA music scene and Alice. Somebody asked me at the opening, was there any, were there any pictures that you wanted to include and you couldn't? And I said, yeah, we have a picture of the bags. But I couldn't use it because it's not Herald Examiner. So I'm sorry. I really wanted the bags in that. But there are, it's every genre. It's heavy metal. It's hardcore. It's punk. It's alternative. It's Paisley Underground. It's just the whole LA music scene from 78 to 89. That's it, just those years. So I hope you check it out. And since you're here, it's down on lower level four in the history department. And uh, okay, so we have time for one more Yes, question. Ashley. Ashley is a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine who has given Are me- Are you Ashley? Yeah, okay. two 
wonderful books at my show where Drew Barrymore bought my Joan Jett picture, gave me a book, The Man Who Shot Garbo, and then a book on Garbo's possessions. I want to see something. Ashley, if you can hold over just a moment. I've seen now that the lights are up. I want to acknowledge two other people here. We have the supremely wonderful Helen Killer. You want to stand up or shake her? She's in the blue hair. I loved Helen. Helen and Trudy, I photographed all the time, but you showed up at the outdoor thing and Trudy didn't make it. Is that Gary behind you? No, no, which, okay, I'm sorry. Alrighty, so, um, Ashley, ask a good question. I mean, I know you'll ask a question. I'm sorry, ask your question. Well, <laughs> you said earlier in the presentation that you preferred taking what I'll just call paparazzo shots of everybody in concert, in action, spontaneous shots as opposed to posing people, but you and I have talked before. You were always a fan of Clarence Bull, George Harrell, a lot of the MGM and other Hollywood photographers, studio photographers of the 20s and 30s and 40s. How did your interest in that style of portraiture inform this, you know, your punk era photographs, or did it, or how did it, yes or no, or in what ways, or whatever? These are really great questions, and this is why I could talk for four hours. Um, I don't like photography. It, now you can see what you have, kind of, but not really. With digital, you can't really see what's in focus or not. Everything seems to be sharp and flat, and then you put it on the computer and you realize there's some depth there, and some things are really sharp, and some are soft, or the colors are different. But at least you can kind of see if it's everything's in frame. Uh, I hated it because I never knew what would be the next day, and so um, not having any experience in lighting I mentioned this, I have a real low self-esteem. I just didn't do these pictures, and yet the one time I rented the lights from on Highland where you could go and rent studio lights and shot the screamers, the photos were amazing. They were freaking amazing. But I just didn't do studio pictures, and I think the real thing was a thing called time and money. I would shoot at night, go to the black and white lab, Richards across from Hollywood High, and then a variety of the color labs, and uh, whatever was in business or didn't ruin my pictures too much, sleep for a few hours, get up and look through magazines and based upon pictures and the buzz on the street of who to see, uh, could I, who are the record companies to get a photo pass, find out if there's a party or something, and then start all over, take a shower, get made up, go to a show, go to a party, and that was 24-7. I didn't really have time to do these studio shots and even the money to rent the lights. And the interesting thing to me is I constantly look at art. I love Pinterest. And you know, you've been at my place. It's loaded with books. I have books in my bed. It's not a joke. I have this California king size bed, and I have a box of books and a stack of books next to it. I just rented, I rented, borrowed two more books from the library here. Um, the foot of my bed has books, walls here, book everywhere. And um, so I would be busy reading, but I like looking at visual information, photos from the studios or paintings. But then when I go to do my own thing, I do my own thing. There's no way I can do anything that looks like anybody else. I've never been able to do that, whether I made jewelry or I sewed clothes or my makeup or my wood design and my tie-dyes, my batiks, all the things I've done in my life, all the different media and all the photos and drawings and paintings and whatnot, they don't look like what inspired me at all. It just, it, it just, so, but what inspired me was just because I liked looking at the pictures because it made me happy looking at uh, George Harrell and Harriet Louise Brown. It, it's been a while, I haven't looked at it, all the names, and of course I grew up on Ouija. I grew up on Look on Life magazine. When you're looking at the photos, you can't be depressed. When you're looking at the photos, you can't feel sad or worried or whatever. You're just totally immersed in that. So that's really what I looked at, but there was just no way that, I mean, I did look in some photo magazines and things, how you would do this dramatic lighting, but it didn't compute. It really physically wasn't what I wanted to do. I much preferred, like right here, just real life. I had all these amazing people in front of me, and I don't know if you've been here the whole time, Alice, but talking about you that, and Trudy and Helen and some others who I just photographed so often that every time 
had different clothes, and it was like the screamers photo that they just knew how to pose. You, I mean, my God, I didn't have to do anything but stand and focus. How could I improve on this? Look at that. Helen, was that your cat in nine tails whip? Yes, that's what I said earlier. It got dark, so I don't know how long you've been here, but yeah. And I have a wonderful shot of you at X's apartment with that. And, and oh, at the Tower Records press conference where you had Sid Vicious, your, your boa, your snake around your, your neck. <sighs> who needs art directors? Who needs lighting when you have wonderful people who were so incredibly inventive and playful? And, and I love some of the things. I haven't been on Alice's blog in a long time, but you have posted some amazing pictures at the Canterbury where you guys would get up, dressed up and play. And when the go goes, fun with ropes. <laughs> I've read, yeah. So it was like I wanted to be involved in an art environment my whole life because I was so darn lonely and treated so badly because I'm really creative and bright and energetic. And now I was around people who were just like me. They were creative and energetic and bright. And we all did our thing. And it just wouldn't feel the same to me going into a studio and posing people. I don't really like art directing. I didn't have to do anything here. All I had to do was be there. <laughs> that was a hard job, just finding out where to go. <laughs> and then there's other things, too, like when I had this sham picture, I, this was my real skill that I don't know where this came from because <gasps> what did I know about rock and roll? I had to snap that picture at exactly the right moment. I got so many photos of people in the height of action. If I missed this, and I was using a flash because there wasn't enough light, I missed it. That, so that's, I just kind of shot what you know worked at that moment in a studio like move your head this way and tilt your head here. This is why I don't do photography now. Then I have a really expensive camera and studio equipment. I started reading about it. I don't want to tell people, move your head. There's a whole thing. Line up with the S curve in your body and do this and that. I'm like, ugh. I, already people accuse me of being bossy. I don't want to art direct people and do like that. It's not. I like, OK, next question. Oh, I know. They said that was the end. Oh, Marina. I want to hear what you have to say. Oh. <laughs> Okay, and in the meanwhile, let me go find, where is Marina? They had to be early. <sighs> okay, so Jen, while you're looking, um, uh, first of all, I feel so grateful to have had you document our lives. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's incredible what you've captured, and I love to hear you in a position of finally having this level of perspective towards those times, which is incredible. But what amazes me is how in the midst of all the insanity that you somehow kept these archives together and were able to access this stuff to be here today to actually show it to us. How did you ever have it together to maintain this catalog archive in that time? That's, that's a really good place to actually end. When I wrote Punk Pioneers, um, sadly, the editors changed every word. I read it, I can't even understand it. And I'm a very good writer. And although I did make some typos here because I was half asleep and I didn't, wasn't proofreading and I had time, I worked really hard on that book. And they, I quoted from Stephen Sondheim's Pulitzer Prize winning musical Sunday in the Park with George about design and unity because I learned that in college and I've always studied art. And the, and the other thing I quoted, and I don't know how much they kept in the book, was Marvin Hamlish wanted to write a hit song, a ballad, for a chorus line. Because he knew typical show musicals don't get on the radio. So he wrote a song called What I Did for Love. And... Um, I'm sorry, I get a little real emotional about this. I should learn to do that tapping because that helps you not get so emotional. But I have made a lot of sacrifices um, and worked really hard. And yet at the same token, it's hard to really call them sacrifices because this has really created a wonderful life for me. 
And I really appreciate that you all care about these photos because I cared about the people in them and did not realize the photos were valuable themselves. And so having studied art history, I just knew that this would be important 30 years down the line. What I did not realize was that I would have to be working on it 30 years down the line. I'm like, really? <sighs> yeah. One guy on Facebook was so cute. He, he said, well, if you're not taking pictures, what else do you do? <laughs> he doesn't know me like some of you do. What else do I do? A ton of things. My dream ambition, which I'm really working towards, that's why I'm going to do these to raise money. I really want to formalize my creative coaching. I have given away a lot of information that I could be making a lot of money and helping a lot more people. Using the internet, we, artists don't want to market, but we have to. Whether you have a job or you're a housewife and thinking about blogging and you've raised families and you've lived through difficult times and diseases, um, you all have stories to tell. And connecting with other people who share that is an amazing thing. You know, shipping things off to New Zealand and Scotland. The reason I know it's Scotland because I was checking the address. I was like, is this right? And so I went to the map. So I might have sold more to Scotland before. I haven't always checked. Because um, it's all United Kingdom. It doesn't break it up. So um, I did it because... I felt an obligation to all the people I photographed that there's so much incredible history here. It should not be lost, even though so few people will support it financially. There's a lot of lip service. And I really, in 2015, want to talk about that in terms of what you're doing and dreaming big and how to use the internet and Lightroom, I couldn't have done this without Lightroom and Photoshop. I know people who say they're photographers. They don't use Lightroom and Photoshop. I'd still be working on this for the next month. I use Lightroom to sort these. When I woke up at like at 8 after falling asleep at 7 and going, <gasps> I told Marina and Michelle I would have photos of them. I didn't put them, oh my gosh. And Jenny and everybody else. And uh, I already had Helen. Um, but I got up and, you know, went to Lightroom where I have things in folders and I can see thumbnails really easily. And I went through and grabbed them and opened them in Photoshop. And I have a template for, that's the black background. And it has safe areas and stuff and whatnot. And the little logo thing, on, not logo, but copyright stuff on the left. And I plugged the pictures in. So I, it's something that I just did because it needs to be done. Yes. I just wanted to say thank you very much. I wanted to make sure I got a chance to give you a hug. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Wendy because was I'm, great. Because I'm going down. With thank you so, so much for being here. And uh, I love Jenny, and I'm really glad that you do too, and, and that you see, you see this legacy that she's preserved for us. You know, um, she's the only one with these photos of the mask and that period. She's the only one that we, that,